In the modern era, the U.S. Navy is considered the most powerful navy in the world due to its 12 carrier task forces. While today, a navy strength is measured by its aircraft carriers, prior to World War II, a navy strength was measured by the number of battleships it possessed. Any officer expressing a different view found themselves with significantly bleaker career options. After Ernest King took command of a new aircraft carrier in 1930 and participated in several years of naval war games, he saw the future of the Navy in the carrier and took a stance favoring naval aviation taking a stronger role in the Navy. His stance would see him facing forced early retirement. After Pearl Harbor, King's dead career was resurrected by Secretary of the Navy Knox, and King was given the two highest positions in the Navy, positions he held until soon after World War II, when he voluntarily retired. World War II demonstrated the accuracy of his vision for the future of the Navy. King's ideas and tactics became early carrier doctrine, and to this day, the carrier remains the strongest naval vessel in the world. Before World War II and the age of air power, the U.S. Navy was dominated by a group of officers, now known as the Cult of the Battleship. This group of officers believed that the battleship was the pinnacle of naval engineering and that they were invincible vessels. Due to the vast majority of the Navy being a part of the cult, any officers who brought new ideas suggesting that other vessels might replace the battleship found their careers blocked. The formation of the cult is attributed to two main factors, the external influence of the Royal Navy and the internal influence of Theodore Roosevelt and Alfred Thayer Mahan. For hundreds of years, the Royal Navy had been the most powerful force in the world, and therefore the standard the rest of the world looked to when evaluating their navies. During the Age of Sail, the Royal Navy desired to have more guns and speed on their ships, always looking to improve these characteristics. These characteristics were still the leading goals for ships when Sir John Fisher's HMS Dreadnought, a steam-powered battleship, was launched in 1905. HMS Dreadnought was so successful, she sparked a naval arms race known as Dreadnought Fever around the world. The age of the battleship had begun. Rivalries with France and Germany drove the Royal Navy to constantly build better ships, pulling the rest of the world with it. The Dreadnoughts quickly gave way to Super Dreadnoughts, or the World War I era battleship. Within the United States, Admiral Alfred Thayer Mahan, a prominent naval strategist, influenced naval doctrine with the publishing of his book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. Mahan believed that countries with greater navies had a greater worldwide impact based on the idea that trade affects your worldwide impact. To have good trade, a nation must be able to protect its trading vessels through the use of bastions around the globe and a modern navy. These bastions, in turn, would also need to be protected and supplied by the Navy, making the possession of a strong Navy the number one requirement for a country that wanted a strong global influence. Mahan's idea of a strong Navy was one that consisted mainly of battleships and smaller vessels. The battleships, of course, would do the work, while the other vessels would only support the battleship. Mahan's ideas influenced Theodore Roosevelt, who served as Secretary of the Navy, and was later elected to the U.S. presidency. Roosevelt wanted a strong foreign policy and set out to reform the Navy. He eventually created the Great White Fleet, composed mostly of battleships, which eventually sailed around the world, projecting U.S. naval power. Even later, when aircraft carriers were shown to be better than battleships during the Pacific Fleet exercises, the Navy refused to change. As Admiral Sims, a prominent admiral, once said, it is an astonishing thing, the conservationism of the military mind. You have got to shed their blood before they give in. Following World War I, the nations involved tried to prevent another war by forming the League of Nations and limiting the arms a country could possess. When the U.S. signed the Washington and London Naval Limitation Treaties, it agreed to limit the tonnage of capital ships it possessed to a 5-5-3 ratio with Great Britain and Japan. No new battleships could be built, and cruisers and destroyers were also limited. As part of these treaties, the U.S. agreed to stop construction of two unfinished battle cruisers. However, instead of destroying the hulls, the Navy was allowed to convert them into aircraft carriers, which were not as restricted by the treaties. These hulls were finished as the Lexington-class aircraft carriers. 
the U.S. Navy's first major aircraft carriers and the vessels on which Admiral King would form his opinions of naval aviation. During the interwar years, Commander Ernest King was running submarine salvage operations on a submarine tender, successfully recovering two submarines. A hard-working officer, he was looking for a post as captain of the cruiser. However, due to the naval treaties, cruisers were scarce. When Admiral Moffat of the Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics offered King command of a carrier, King leapt at the opportunity, undergoing basic flight training to earn his wings, a requirement for any commander of an aircraft carrier. After completing his training, he was given command of the aircraft tender Wright, and in early 1930, he was offered the command of USS Saratoga. King declined this offer because the Saratoga was configured as a flagship, so he would always have an admiral breathing down his back. Having set his sights on the Lexington, King worked in the Bureau of Aeronautics under Moffat until June 1930, when he was given command of the Lexington. While he was in command of the Lexington, and later as a vice admiral commanding U.S. carriers, King discovered the potential of the aircraft carrier through the Pacific Fleet exercises, and was quoted saying, there never seemed any doubt that carriers were essential. During the interwar period, the U.S. Pacific Fleet held annual war games called the Fleet Problems, in which vessels would participate in simulated attacks against other vessels. During Fleet Problem 13, King demonstrated Pearl Harbor's weakness against carriers when he successfully bombed it with planes from Lexington and Saratoga, as well as destroying the other team's flagship, the battleship Pennsylvania. In the following fleet problems, King continued to champion the carrier, attempting to prove its worth by successfully bombing Pearl Harbor an additional two times. According to Lieutenant Commander George J. Walsh, a World War II veteran and dive bombing historian, King's findings were discounted for two main reasons. First, King had attacked on Sunday. Nobody would ever attack on a Sunday. Second, the officers in charge were battleship admirals, who continually claimed King cheated or circumvented the rules. As a testament to King's strategies, in the 1950s, when a U.S. admiral asked one of the planners of Pearl Harbor how they planned the attack, the response given was, We took Admiral King's methods and converted them from dive bombers to torpedo bombers. While the U.S. Navy didn't take his findings to heart, King did. His actions had unfortunate consequences. King's next chance for promotion was when the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Bill Leahy, retired in 1939. Due to his connections to naval aviation, he was passed over in favor of Admiral Harold Stark, an officer with a more suitable background in battleships. Shortly afterwards, King was posted to the General Board, an elephant's graveyard for officers, likely as a result of his ties to naval aviation. Even after this devastating blow, King remained firmly behind the carrier. His commitment was rewarded after Pearl Harbor when Secretary of the Navy Knox assigned him to the posts of Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Fleet and also Chief of Naval Operations. In these roles, he was considered so crucial to the war effort that when he reached the mandatory retirement age, President Roosevelt allowed him to stay on in the Navy where he eventually became one of only four officers to ever hold the rank of Fleet Admiral. He voluntarily retired in December of 1945. Admiral King's commitment to the aircraft carrier led to the change of power in the U.S. Navy from the battleship to the aircraft carrier, a change that can still be seen today. Since World War II, no new battleship has been commissioned, and the Iowa-class battleships, which served in the Korean and Vietnam Wars, only saw action as land bombardment platforms. The carriers, on the other hand, have seen extensive action in Korea, Vietnam, and all wars since. They also play a large role in delivering humanitarian aid when needed. The legacy of King's stance lasts to this day as the U.S. Navy builds the Gerald R. Ford class carriers. The carrier is here to stay.